All right. Hello and welcome to the Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am delighted to be joined by Tony Hughes, who is in beautiful Sydney, Australia this morning, I would say, right? <laughs> hey, John. Yeah, I'm coming to you from the future, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tomorrow morning, in fact. Yes, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And Tony is an international keynote speaker, best-selling author, um, professional um, sales educator, and one of the, and I think the top read uh, author on LinkedIn for anything related to, to sales, sales management. And so a lot of experience uh, from Tony. And what we thought we'd talk about today is a lot of you I know are in uh, the final quarter of your calendar year. Most people are, a lot of people are on fiscal calendar years. And maybe you're trying to reach your quota and you're looking at your, your book of business and you're seeing some deals that are stalled and you really wish you could get them moving and maybe make your quota or exceed your quota or whatever. So that's what I thought we'd talk about today, this whole concept of how to unstall stall deals. Uh, and so, Tony, what are some of the things that a salesperson can look at first when they're looking at deals that appear to be stalled? Yeah, John, it's a really interesting topic and I'm going to share some things that will maybe be a little depressing for people that are trying to unstuck stall deals at the end of a quarter because the reality is the way we open has a huge bearing on the way we get to close a deal. A lot of people say to me that, hey, my people know how to sell. Uh, they just need a bit of training on your know, closing techniques. And I say, well, mm -hmm. it's, it's rarely the case that the problem is closing techniques. Mm -hmm. The problem is that people are uh, open in a fairly poor way where they fail to anchor the business case value or the commercial value for change. And then the other thing that people tend to fail to do is they fail to uh, help the client achieve consensus inside the organization. We live in the age of consensus based decision making. So even head kicking type A personality types of leaders are smart enough today to know that even if they want to drive change through, uh, they need to do the change management piece well and get people on board, take them through the journey. So when we open a deal, we need to open with the business case value for change. And we need to then help them go and build the, the, the business case internally in a way that gathers consensus. Because what I often find happen, or what, what I find happens is that the reason a deal stalls is as it starts to get socialized or pushed to other people in the organization. And here's the interesting thing about when mm. you push a decision into an organization. As sellers, we tend to focus on the person or people we think will say yes to this decision, the oh. people with economic power. But the reality is there's normally a number of people in the organization that can say no. So even though they're not the ones with the budget and authority to say yes, they can say no. So, for example, I was working with a client yesterday that sells to the CFO, um, very high value solution, but the procurement team would be part of implementing. Mm. And they had not socialized it with procurement. It was a way of uh, getting additional discounts out of suppliers mm -hmm. or big corporates. And the head of procurement said, look, you know, this all sounds good, but we've just done a restructure. We've laid off a bunch of people across the company and a number of them are in my area of procurement. And we just do not have the bandwidth to take on any new, any new uh, projects in procurement. Right. So what happened was procurement said no, even though the CFO wanted to say yes. And you think, well, can't the CFO just stick his or her finger in the chest of head of procurement and say, no, no, we're doing this, make it a priority. Mm -hmm. But it's just not how business works today. So yeah. if deals go quiet, it's often because they're trying to socialize it. And that's one of the reasons it stalls. So one of the things, um, just following on from that, so one of the things that you obviously when a deal stalls, a good thing to do is to maybe backtrack a little bit and go back and really ask yourself the question, did I, did I qualify this properly enough? Have I, as you said, have I socialized this? Yeah. Did, I, did I actually go beyond that person who seems to love me in the organization and actually find out who else was involved in the decision making and, and find the naysayers? So, I mean, doing some forensics on, on the early part of your deal is probably not a bad thing to do, is it? Yeah, it, it, it's very true. And um, uh, there's some things that, that sellers can do. The first thing is, Whenever we are trying to create an opportunity, we need to uh, qualify on the basis of level of engagements. You know, you, you talked about qualification. I find a lot of people focus on their acronyms, you know, whether it's, you know, BANT or MANDACT or Scotsman mm -hmm. or, 
nutcase. There's all these crazy <laughs> qualification processes. I've got my own RSVP selling as a qualification mm-hmm. framework. But rather than focusing on those things, you know, budget, authority, need, timeline, etc., mm-hmm. the real thing we need to do is qualify on the basis of level of engagement because it's mm-hmm. the degree to which the customer will share information with us and also the degree to which they'll give us access to their people right. that determines whether we should really push forward. Um, and because in between opening and closing is the middle, and what I find is the middle is often where deals go to die. So the way you avoid the deal dying is you make sure that you uh, help gather consensus, but you make sure that every single meeting creates progression. We need to avoid the busy, full, professional visitor coffee drinking syndrome, where we're endlessly checking in with people thinking, well, mm-hmm. if I just keep building the relationship, they'll get sick, of, sick and tired of seeing my face and will buy something <laughs> from me to get rid of me. We need to make sure every meeting has progression and that every meeting has something for the customer the customer to do. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's critically important, all this is depressing, right? Trying to close a deal. Yeah, yeah. And you did, well, you, you, you know, you've just got what you've got. So here's the other thing you can do. You can create what the industry calls a close plan. Uh, customers don't like being uh, qualified and they don't like being closed. Mm-hmm. But what they do like is you being aligned with them. So don't call it an, a closed plan with them. Call it an alignment plan, a project alignment right. plan. And just say, hey, hey, Mary, I just want to make sure that our resources are lined up for you when you need them. Uh, I've taken the liberty of getting a bit of a sort of Gantt chart together of what I think mm-hmm. successful implementation looks like for you and working backwards. Can I share this with you? So you sort of print it out and sit down with them and say, I'll share this with you. Is there anything I've missed? You know, Because the degree to which we truly understand their uh, evaluation selection and then procurement processes is the degree to which we can forecast accurately and close. Because often what happens is we seek to close, we seek progression when they're not ready or not able to commit. Right. And the thing that's bizarre in this world is, um, you know, there's sort of a reputation that sellers have of, you know, salespeople are not very truthful. Mm-hmm. Um, what I find is buyers are liars. You know, I find <laughs> yeah. that buyers either inadvertently or deliberately just lie to sellers. You know, they're saying, no, look, I'm making the decision. Don't talk to anybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, it's given me the proposal. I'll get it across the line. And then it turns out they... They've got no credibility internally. They had no uh, ability to sort of sell internally. So we need to always be saying to people, hey, what's the timing and process for you getting this in place? Yeah. Not for buying from me, but from getting this implemented and in place as so delivering the results that we've talked about. Who else needs to be involved? Does this, does this need to go to the board? If it does, how do you get on board papers? Do you need to put a business case up? Please let me help you develop the business case. I've done this mm-hmm. with lots of organizations. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do as the project manager here inside your own organization is, yeah. is put this up and then it gets rejected and you know, that'll damage your own brand. Um, so let me help you build a rock solid business case and let's socialize this with other people internally that, that will have a point of view about it or that they'll feel are impacted. And that's really how you de-risk anything you're trying to close and that you make sure you've got an accurate forecast date. Yeah, and I think just to unpack, there's a couple of things there, but just in what you were touching on just a moment ago is, I think sometimes we forget uh, that, you know, the individuals inside the organization, the buyers, like sometimes they have a lot riding on this personally, or they have angst around it. And the more you can, as you say, you can reassure them and you can say, you know, let's look at the plan. Let's look at who else do we need to, you know, get on board, sort of make them feel like you're there to support them and that you're you're there to de-risk the situation for them because obviously the other way around then they just they become the staller because they don't want to take the risk themselves yeah i love that because all of us need to talk the language of leaders as we go and engage and the language of leaders is actually numbers not words you know what they Mm -hmm. care about is measurable outcomes and it's not a measurable outcome unless it uh it can be expressed in terms of dollars percentages or some key result area in their business and then once they've decided that they want that particular outcome, the thing they then care about is risk. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, when we open a deal, because again, if we open well, it'll help us close. Closing yeah. will be a natural next step, not a white knuckle roller coaster mm-hmm. ride where we're hoping. Uh, whenever we open, we should be saying, hey, you know, what's happened inside your organization that's caused you to want to be looking at this now? Mm-hmm. And then we need to ask, you know, what sort of results would you need to get if you were going to invest in change? And then the third question is, hey, where do you see your risks, your, your own risks in getting this implemented successfully? 
And those three questions really get them focused on business case. Mm -hmm. It gets them focused on building consensus and managing all of their risk. And once we've done that, we're the most likely ones to win because even if there's others that can technically do what we do, internally they're going to say, do you know what? This vendor, this person, they, they truly understand us. They took the time to understand what we're really trying to achieve, what our culture is internally, how we can manage all of the change risk. So although there's two others that have got a similar kind of offering, maybe are a bit cheaper, these guys are the lowest risk because they understand us. Yeah. And if you come back to what looks like a stall deal, but if you come back with that kind of communication where, as you said earlier, where you're looking to get alignment, where you're looking to, you know, really understand the process, the chances of them reacting to you are much higher than if you say, hey, Tony, I'm just checking in to see where we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. And actually, can I just jump on that? Because I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. with you. The worst thing salespeople can do is just keep endlessly checking in about where <laughs> their deal's at, right? And all that, yeah. all that does is become an annoyance for the person. So I know we're tight for time, uh, so let me just maybe give some useful information about yep. how you do try and un, un, unstop the deal if you just got what you've got. So the first thing is don't just keep trying to be a professional visitor and check in. That's just annoying. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a reason for each interaction. Um, the, so the things that you can do is have new information that you want to introduce that you think is relevant to them, that can further reduce their risk, that can strengthen their business case. Um, maybe it's another client that's implemented that's similar mm -hmm. to them, you know, that you want to introduce them to. Mapping our senior executives into their senior executives is a really important thing. Right. Um, using third parties in the ecosystem, you know, that can potentially work for us, you know, depending on, on what it is that we sell. So the, the thing that we need to be thinking about as we're trying to close is what would be a valid reason in the mind of the client for me to have another interaction with them? Uh, and it needs to be on the basis of some new information or a new relationship that we want to introduce. Um, you know, that's, that's the thing we need to think about and make sure we understand what their process and timing is internally because often sellers are trying to close deals that actually aren't closable yeah. And I, you and I have got a strong history in the software industry and the software industry, actually the whole tech industry has been legendarily, awesomely <laughs> terrible at educating clients how they can always get a discount in our, mm -hmm. in our inflection point of desperation, you know, end yeah. of quarter, end of year, I'll give you a discount if you buy. They go, well, now yeah. I know what your real cheapest price is, but exactly. I can't buy now anyway. It's going to get approved by someone who's off on vacation. Yeah, but good to know. Good to know that when I do come to buy, I know what the cheapest price is. Price is yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I like that other thing that you mentioned because um, we know we know that they're on the buyer side that there's more people involved. But I do think on the seller side is um, sellers can be really bad at getting their own teams involved, right? As you say, bringing in other other executives from other departments or other skill sets and mapping them into the people at the at the client. I, I think a lot of people are very bad at that. You know, it's true. You know, there's an ancient saying that it takes a village to raise a child. And the, mm -hmm. and the truth is it, it takes a rock solid team to go and win a big enterprise deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the lone wolf um, sales rep is a very dangerous model. Yeah. Um, you know, what you want is a strategist and an engineer who's connecting people together in deals and engineering the business case and thinking about risk and trying to set competitor traps. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's really what it takes to win. And I think um, putting and, and looking forward, so even beyond this court or whatever, I think it's a great point to take away from this conversation too, is that idea of your deal may not actually be stalled right now. It may actually have been stalled all the way along. If you look back yeah. and you see, as you said, you see that you've had meeting after meeting, but you haven't, the customer hasn't done, the prospect hasn't done anything. Nothing has actually moved forward. But you have, you have seen this as progression because, well, you had one meeting, then you had another meeting, you've had another meeting. But reality, it was it stalled way back then, not now. John, that's absolute gold. Everybody that's listening to this should just mm. rewind that bit because what you said is so, so true. It's, it's the degree to which the customer is doing things that determines whether the deal is progressing. <laughs> it's not us continually visiting and reselling them yeah. every time we turn up. If every yeah. time we turn up, they've lost all their motivation from the previous meeting, we didn't have any yeah. progress at all. Exactly. And you have become so you have become the classic free lunch, right? And the, fa and the <laughs> fact that they're not, and the fact that they're not, uh, 
you know, taking your call anymore. Maybe just the fact they're just bored with the free lunches now. Who knows? Or somebody else is buying them better lunches. I don't know what. But but if you can't see measurable progress each time, yeah, your deal got stalled a long, long time ago. Yeah. Hey, um, <laughs> and John, I'll just finish on this one because I know yep. you do awesome things in the world of CRM yourself. I think for every organization in the way that they've implemented their own CRM mm-hmm. is they need to be monitoring time in stage. So yes. when you think about all of your sales stages aligned with buyer's journey and then think about if something is in a particular stage for more than a period of time, is that a red flag? Because again, in between yes. opening and closing is the middle. It's where things stall or die. So you need to make sure, do I know what my entry and exit gates are in and out of each stage? And do I know how long things should sit in each stage? Yeah. I need to I need to monitor the activities for for uh, inbound and outbound gates on those stages, but also once it's been in that stage, if it's more than you know fourteen days or something, have a flag pop up in your CRM. Yeah, and think, man, this is now at in, in, at risk of dying, you know, rather than just taking longer. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Because there's nothing worse than you see something sitting in a stage and you say, "Wow, that's been in there for like ninety days," and that was, yeah. and it's in the proposal stage. You say, "Okay, so you propose, you made a proposal three months ago, and they still haven't responded, <laughs> or whatever." Probably yeah. isn't in the proposal stage anymore. <laughs> no, and how and how can you be putting a proposal in when you didn't do the the qualification yeah. and discovery phase properly, and you didn't d- it, develop it, needs well, and you, it's not anchored in some kind of business case? for change internally yeah exactly because as we know the top the top sales organizations not only do they have a sales process with stages but each stage has particular things that need to happen and those that's are, right and there's time frames and all of that and it's nice and tightly managed because at the end of the day you know if uh, unless you're managing these things tightly then it all becomes a little bit haphazard yeah yeah that's great john thank you all right listen this is fantastic tony before we go uh just tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you uh so you can find me in linkedin so tony hughes in linkedin uh i've got a speaker and author website uh tonyhughes.com.au i've got two best-selling uh books the joshua principle and combo prospecting um and you can also find me at sales iq sales iq it's a global sales enablement platform and uh really enjoyed the conversation thanks and i highly recommend you check out tony if you haven't already you probably already know him but just in case you haven't uh, go check it out Uh, you know prolific writer and great stuff and those books are excellent too listen tony thanks very much your name is john golden sales pop online sales magazine pipeline or crm see you all for another expert interview really soon bye now